This is part two of John's baptism, a water baptism of Jesus. We, if you recall, we did uh, John one last time, uh, which is the the longer account of it. But um, there are so many unique things when you study the, this. Uh, the John's you'll hear see me refer to John the Baptist as JB, but. Um, uh, anyhow, um, all four gospels mention this and, and that's pretty, that's pretty important when you, there's a, I, I don't know if you're familiar, but there's a book that was written many, many years ago. It, it probably still in print. I, I don't really know. Mine is ancient, but it was called the harmony of the gospels. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And they ran them parallel. They ran everything parallel. So if it was mentioned in four of them, you would be able to see them in parallel, which is, was an excellent book when you study the four Gospels. It, it's a, I, I suppose they probably still have it, but um, probably, you know, if you can't find it anywhere else, you go to Amazon, don't you? But anyhow, um, this is one of them that's mentioned there. So when you do, the reason this guy produced the harmony of the gospel, because once you find this out that you look for things, it's either going to be in, when you study the four gospel, it's either Matthew and Mark run parallel. Luke runs kind of on his own, but close to them. And then John runs on his own. Um, that's kind of the way you study the, and so the, if you've got Matthew and Mark, the, almost they're going to run almost parallel. And then Luke is going to run with them. And when Luke runs with them, they call that the synoptics. And then John is kind of like out here on his own. Uh, and so when you know that Matthew and Mark run together and Luke kind of runs on his own, but comes over every once in a while with the other two guys, then they have a word for that synoptic. But when you find four of them run parallel, it's a pretty big deal. And so it, a guy comes along, he he's a student of the word of God. He realizes that and he writes his book, which is just a wonderful book to have in your possession called the harmony of the gospels. And so he does that for you. I think it's probably the mine is, was, was done in the King James, uh, version of it. Um, and, uh, my early days of my ministry, I about wore that book out. <laughs> I mean, I wore that thing out. Um, but now the new study Bibles are so good that they show you all that stuff. Um, a lot of times a good study Bible will have a harmony of the Gospels in it. So you might look. A lot of people, they buy a book and don't pay any attention to what all's in their book. But sometimes you can buy a study Bible. I didn't look in this one, but to tell you the truth, I didn't look at the one at home because, you know, I know all that now. Not that I know it all now, but, I mean, I know where to get all that. So, um, well, anyhow, but this one, the bapt John's baptism is mentioned in all four Gospels. So that's a big deal. And, and here's what you do. And this is why the Harmony of the Gospel was, was printed uh, for, for young pastors like myself when I started. Is to be able to show you that they all, the, all the, all, we got four writers, they all write on this. And I've told you, you know that Matthew and Mark are going to run pretty close to what they're going to say. Luke is going to add you something different. And then John, you, you have no idea where John's going. He's going to go theologically what he's going to do. But, but if he mentions it, then you really pay attention. So what you have with the John's baptism, and I'm going to show that. The reason I came back to do one more study was to kind of show you some things and to make you aware that, that this is really important. Uh, to your to your personal study, um, you're, you'll see what I'm going to do for you. I, w I went and studied all four of them. I'm going to show you what they all agree on. Now, it doesn't mean they don't agree on it. Understand, they're all going to approach it from a different avenue of discussion. 
So what I'm going to do tonight with you, I'm going to show you what they all agree on, which, which to all of them, they go like, this was the meat of the deal, right? Everybody's going to agree on, and I'm going to show you that. Then I'm going to, uh, that's going to be point one. And then point two, what I'm going to do is I'm going to show you what each one added that they thought was important that the other person may have not thought. And uh, Mark, uh, Matthew is going to say something and Mark's going to say something. Uh, but we know that Mark, Matthew and Mark are going to run pretty close, right? Then Luke's going to come out with something. And John, he, pfft, oh, John's way over there. It doesn't mean they're in dispute of anything. It just means somebody is going to add a little twist to it. So I'm going to show you all that. And then, um, and then I'm going to deal with one of them that I've always found interested in. Since I'm the teacher, I get to pick, don't I? Uh, one of the things I found interesting when I studied the harmony of this, the harmony of the Gospels on this regard to this doctrine, it was Matthew. Matthew records, Matthew, and that's where we're going tonight, Matthew 3, 13 through 17, and reading in a moment. Uh, he discussed a personal conversation between John the Baptist and Jesus Christ before the baptismal service. Because John has prevented, John says, I'm not going to do this. I mean, mine, my ministry is twofold. One, I, I preach repentance for the kingdom of God is coming. And my deal is to prepare a people for the meeting of the Messiah. And I don't think, I mean, and, and so he had a, listen to me now, this is important. He had a, it will be an important moment. He had a way of qualifying what I call VIPs for the coming of Christ. He had a way of qualifying people. Uh, and he called it the fruit of repentance for the forgiveness of sins. And in the end, it will cost John his head. But uh, because he, he strayed away from what his original calling was, right? I mean, his call was specific. You're to be a prophet to announce the coming of Christ, right? I mean, it was specific. And, and he, but that's another story and another time. So here we are in Matthew, just kind of giving you a heads up a little bit. Here we are in Matthew, the third chapter, in this private conversation between John the Baptist and Jesus before the baptismal service. Jesus comes to him, says, I want to be baptized. And he goes, whoa, 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 I don't think so. And here, here is this conversation uh, I thought was kind of important. Jesus arrived from Galilee at the Jordan, coming to John to be baptized by him. John tried to prevent it, tried to prevent him, saying, I have need to be baptized with you, and do you come to me? That poses a question. He said, this is, this, I mean, you're not a candidate. I mean, you're way beyond that. You understand what he's saying? That's what he's saying. And you go like, well, wait a minute, John. I thought your purpose was to identify the Messiah. Well, I have a twofold ministry in my water baptism. One is to prepare people to, to qualify them as VIP people for, for the coming of the Messiah, to, to, to welcome him. We've got a celebrity coming, Dad. And uh, I got to prepare a crowd for him, a people for him. The other hand, his baptism was to definitely John goes into great detail, was to identify who the person of the Messiah was, right? He knew the Messiah was coming. He didn't know the person. And so God had given him, and, and all the baptisms certainly identify it, that John had been given uh, a code of how to discover who the Messiah was once he was baptized in water, right? Well, come on now. It deals with the dove and the Holy Spirit and all that. Well, anyhow, Jesus answered John and said to him, permitted at this time, for in this way, 
it, look at how important the word time is here. I mean, I mean, I think, I think sometimes we get caught up so much in our affairs, we forget that everything that's moving through our life is under perfect timing. Everything. Everything is in perfect timing. And, and he reminds John, permit it at this time, for in this way, it is fitting for us, notice for us, notice the two ideas for us, right? Not just for me and not just for you, Jesus said, but for us. You've been, you've been sent by God to be the prophet to announce my coming, and here it is, big guy. What's he say? This is the perfect time. And so to fulfill all righteousness, that is to bring the, the plan of God into the human experience of history. Then he, he permitted him. Then he permitted him. After being baptized, Jesus went up immediately from the water and behold, the heavens were opened and he saw, that's John the Baptist. John saw the spirit of God descend as a dove and coming upon him. I mean, it, it's, some would say, uh, uh, lighting on him. Others say, and remain on him. They all give you a little idea about it. And behold, Matthew says, and behold, a voice out of heaven saying, this is my beloved son in whom I'm well pleased. And what's interesting when you study this account, not all of them say the same thing from the voice. Some don't even talk about the voice. And uh, so it's just interesting how they all perceived. It doesn't change what happened, but it's just inter interesting how people perceive. Um, uh, some, like, this is the one. This is my beloved son. Some will say, the voice said, you are my beloved son. You say, well, it's not a lot different. I know. I know. Doesn't change who he was. <laughs> but it does change the perception. Um, well, anyhow, there's my verse. So let's have a word of prayer and let's talk about it. Let's talk about it now. I give you a moment of silence as a believer priest for classroom etiquette. This is for you who are attending with us live streaming. We would encourage you to do this. Make sure you're in a place where the still small voice of God that speaks thunderously in your soul through the ministry of the Holy Spirit and the teaching of the Word of God could operate. He can't operate. It's a spiritual book for spiritual people for spiritual living. You have to be a spiritual person. How do I know it? You can't study it in carnality. How do I know the difference between spiritual and carnal? Personal sin. Personal sin. It could be sins of the tongue or sins of the mental attitude sins, we call them, or overt sins. You, and how would I know that? Well, you, I mean, you got a conscience and you got the Holy Spirit. If you, if you believe that Christ died for your sins, was buried and raised from the dead third day, called the gospel. If you believe that, then you're indwelt by the Holy Spirit. So, I mean, you know it because when you sin, when you become carnal, you sin and become carnal, the Holy Spirit is grieved and quenched. And so between your conscience and the Holy Spirit's conviction, you have a pretty, a pretty solid idea of whether or not you've committed personal sin. And if you have, then 1 John 1, 9 tells you how to get back into spirituality for Bible study. It says, confess your sin. If we confess our sin, we do it through our priesthood and privacy and silence. And that's important for you. He's faithful and just to forgive us and cleanse us. And there it is. That's the dynamics of the Christian life. We live in the dispensation of the ministry of the Holy Spirit. So, Father, we're thankful today for all that you've provided for us. We pray the Holy Spirit would minister the truth of the word of God to our souls. And we can see some of the things that would be important to us as we study John's baptism, water baptism of Jesus and what it was all about. In Jesus name. Amen. Well. I mentioned about most of this stuff, so I want to talk about the five aspects. Uh, we're past my introduction. Uh, the five aspects of John's baptism of Jesus. This is our part two. We've studied John's account of it uh, last time we met. 
notice that part two is from Matthew's account. I'm taking it from Matthew, which we just read. Uh, all four Gospels I mentioned in my introduction seem to have the following six main points. At least these were the ones that seemed to be there, for, at least for me. All four Gospels seem to have the following six main points of emphasis of John's water baptism of Jesus. And so for me, the Harmony of the Gospel really helped me, see, to be able to look at that. They'd lay it out in a parallel form. They're, they show you parallel, and you walk your way through that. Now, you, the, like I said, the, the, the one I have is based on the King James Bible, but it means it's not a problem walking through it. Uh, and so let me, let me go through the, the six things. First, John, J John the Baptist was recognized by Israel. We studied that last time. As a prophet to their nation, there was no disputing that the people, the masses of the people, believe that. In fact, when it came time to to kill John the Baptist, uh, it even made the political leader, leaders in regard to that fact nervous. They went ahead and did it, <laughs> but uh, they weren't sure what would come out of that deal because he was so well recognized as a prophet of the people. So that's kind of important. One of the interesting things, and so I want to show, I want you to go, we're in the third chapter. Let's go to chapter 11. And um, Jesus does something really important in, in 11 that helps us with understanding uh, John's ministry to his life and the beginning of his ministry. And I want to start it in the 11th chapter in verse 7 when if you have a study Bible, they're going to say something in your study Bible about John, a Jesus, a tribute, a tribute to John the Baptist by Jesus, something of that nature, because this is what he does. And uh, they were going away, uh, and as these were going away, Jesus speaking to the multitude said, "Why did?" And watch that. Watch. There's a, a a question that's asked. In verse 7, 8, 9, the same question is asked three times. So that's kind of like a heads up. Usually, if you have three questions, it's not the same one over and over and over again, unless you're what? Convinced people are not getting it, right? That's when you do repeat, repeat, repeat. So it's kind of interesting. Watch this. What did you go out into the wilderness to look at, he says to the people? A reed shaken by the wind? I mean, just did you go out just to take, take a look at what the desert looks like? Let's go to the desert and just have a picnic. Second, what did you go out to see? Say, same question. A man, and so he gets, he's giving answers to what people have, what people are saying. He says, a man dressed in soft clothing. Behold, those who, who wear soft clothing are kings and palaces. Well, what did you go out, say, to see? A prophet? Yes. <laughs> Yeah, see, people were curious, weren't they? People were going out for all kinds of reasons. The Pharisees were going out to figure out what this guy was doing because he was pulling too many people away. He was afraid that there was a movement going on that they weren't attached to and couldn't get information on. Yes, I say to you, and one who is more than a prophet, more than a prophet? More than a, what's, what's more than a prophet? Well, he'll tell you. This is the one about whom it is written. Behold, I send my messengers before your face who will prepare your way before you. You have a study Bible? Look over there. Where is it coming from? Malachi 3.1. Malachi 3.1, really big deal here. Because, listen. When you study it in Matthew earlier, it's all about Isaiah 40, 3 through 5, Malachi. And so there's two places, Malachi 3 and actually Malachi 4. So you have Isaiah 40, you have Malachi 3 and Malachi 4, all talking about the prophet that's going to come to be the proclaimer of the Messiah. Okay. So he introduces something that's really important. Now look. 
He gives a truly I say to you. Matthew don't give a double. Nobody gives a double except John. You remember we're into John right now. Truly, truly, I say to you. But this is a singular truly I say to you, which has the same purpose. It's a messianic doctrine. Truly, I say to you, among those born of women, there was there has not arisen anyone greater than John the Baptist. Now, he said that twice. Now, therefore, we got a marker here. He has said this twice to them in his tribute to John. Yet, watch this now. Yet he who is least in the kingdom of heaven is greater than he. Think about that. There's none greater than John the Baptist, except for those who are in Christ. That's what he's talking about. And anyone in Christ is greater than John the Baptist. Because that was John's mission. Isn't that good? That's pretty good. You know who the least are? All of us sitting in here. <laughs> least in the kingdom is greater than John the Baptist. And as the old saying goes, he was bigger than life. That's. And from the days of John the Baptist until now, it says from the third chapter to the 11th, until now, the kingdom of heaven suffers violence and violent men take it by force. For all the prophets and the law prophesied until John. Think about that. And then he goes on. If you care to accept it, he himself is Elijah who was to come. And that now we're in Malachi 4 and all that business. He who has an ear to hear, let him hear. I like that phrase, don't you? Um, it's, a, it's a phrase that reminds me of teaching children. Did you not hear a thing I said? <laughs> right? Uh, teaching kids. Did you not hear anything I just said? I feel that way sometimes both as a pastor and as a person. My wife say, have you not been, have you not heard a thing I've been saying? And I got, I, you have to think quick on your feet, don't you? Because you, cause you know she got you. Yeah. She got me. Well, anyhow. So there's one. John the Baptist was recognized by Israel as a prophet to the nation. Jesus' tri tribute to J.B. is recorded. And we just looked at it. A very interesting tribute. Uh, in, by, recorded to Matthew, by the way. Uh, John the Baptist's ministry fulfilled the Messianic prophecy of Malachi 3.1 and Isaiah 43 through 5, which we have studied, as the one announcing the coming uh, uh, and the person, not only his coming, but the identity of the person. So I didn't make a misprint in that. Uh, the one announcing John's ministry was to announce the coming and the person, right? That's very important. It wasn't just one thing. It was two things. And, and listen, in, with, in that whole deal of conversation that Matthew records, the conclusion was after the, when John records after this, uh, when John records after this meeting, John records that uh, after the baptism or in the days following, John's message was, behold, the Lamb of God that's come to take away the sin of the world. I mean, what did John learn after he baptized Jesus? That he was the Messiah and that he had come to take away the sins of the world. He didn't know it beforehand, right? He did not know it before. He didn't know who the person was. Come on. All right. And you know what John real and what John did when he called him? See, we got two things. We got a lamb and a dove, right? Both sacrificial. I mean, there's no doubt what those two things about. Both of them used in sacrifice. Uh, the dove was given for the poorest, the least. Um, and 
when he says the Lamb of God that's come to take away the sin of the world, what he's just done is introduce the baptism of death. Where did he do that? At the baptism of water. He introduced, listen, at the baptism of water, listen to me now, this is important. At the baptism of water, God revealed the three other baptisms that Jesus got to go through. The baptism of death, the baptism of the Holy Spirit, and the baptism of fire, right? I mean, the, the, that makes the four baptisms that are, important, that are associated with Jesus Christ. They're really significantly important theologically. And we're going to study all of them, of course. All four gospels, here's the third thing. All four gospels describe J.B.'s desert ministry. This is another one of the things that they all agree with. And they describe him as a voice. And it, it's a prophet. It's a prophetic voice, right? He's a prophet. So it's a prophetic, a prophetic, a prophetic voice of one crying in the wilderness. Make what and what is the voice saying? See, it's a it's a voice of God to the people through a, a recognized prophet. And it is saying, make, is saying two things. First, it's saying, make ready the way of the Lord and then make his path straight. And, and so that's part of his baptism. And who, and who is this going to? It's going to the, to the people of Israel that will come, receive the message, go through the water baptism and, and prepare and receive a VI of what I call the VIP pass. Not everybody who came to John got baptized by John. We, right? We've studied that. Not everybody came to him. I mean, he wasn't just into, into a numbers game. Um, I mean, those Pharisees and Sadducees that came out, he went like, no way. Get out of here. Get your life in order. I don't sound like a numbers guy. Um, here's another point that they all seem to remember. These are all the things they all seem to be in line with in their message. John the Baptist's central message behind make ready the way of the Lord. The central message behind this voice saying make ready the way of the Lord was repentance for the forgiveness of sins because the kingdom of heaven is at hand. John knew that he would at one day baptize somebody that would be declared the, the Messiah. It is interesting when the guy come most qualified to be the Messiah by his life, right? That's what he's going by. He, he said, no, I'm not going to baptize you. <laughs> Isn't that interesting? I mean, he just got caught blindsided. Now, how is that possible? Well, I don't know. How is it possible for you to know the word of God and then make a bad decision, go a different way, and then go like, oh, wait, what did I just do? Right? I don't know, I'm going to be too hard in John on this deal. But. Look, I want to show you something. It's amazing to me how people can know the word of God. It bothers me that people could know the word of God. Parents teach their children that, and somehow it gets, it gets lost in the whole business. But you're parents, and so you know how that happens, right? Come on now. Of course we all do that because it's, it's volitional. But I want, to go, I want you to go to Luke with me for a moment. Luke, the first chapter, 16 and 17. Because now we have the reality of this prophecy. This is a, 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 a prophecy given to Zechariah about, about the coming of his child into the world. When he's told you're going to have a child, right? And they're up in age, right? Like Abraham and Sarah business. And listen, do you think that wasn't an eye-opening moment in his life too? That, would you think that was a big deal? Well, listen to what, and Gabriel shows up and has a talk with him. Um, uh, let's see, this thing starts earlier, Zechariah, verse 13, the angel meet with him, and he says, you know, I bring you uh, uh, glad tidings. Um, verse 15, for he, he talks about this 
your wife is going to become pregnant and you're going to have a child. And this is who this child is going to be. He will be, watch it. Watch how Gabriel tells him what God says about him, right? I mean, when Gabriel brings a note, it's from God. All right. For he will be great in the sight of the Lord. He will drink no wine or liquor. He will be filled with the Holy Spirit. Those two things go together, by the way. You eliminate one so you can have the other. Listen, I used to preach this all the time at uh, the, re re uh, the rehab centers. I, I, I wore this verse out. Right? It, it, and you know what alcohol and drugs are called? It, it's spirit, you know. That, well, but they're called spirit. spirit. Yeah, they're called spirits, you know. You, and they're not talking about it is what the, what, how it affects you. <laughs> uh, and, he, and he will be filled with the Holy Spirit while yet in his mother's womb. He will turn back many of the sons of Israel to the Lord their God. Watch this now because this is, this is where, what's being played out in his life when he is, when he is just prior to his 31st birthday. You know how I know that? I read Luke's account. And, and it is he who will go as a forerunner before him, Messiah, in the spirit and power of Elijah. To turn the hearts of the fathers back to the children. This is his ministry now. I'm talking ministry now. Right? To, he'll have a ministry in the spirit and power of Elijah. Not Elijah himself. That's second coming. But he will come in the spirit and the power of Elijah. To turn the hearts of the fathers back to the children. Boy, do we need that today. This is a revival we need. And the disobedient to the attitude of the righteous, so as to make, watch this now, so as to make ready a people prepared for the Lord, right out of the shotgun of Isaiah, right? You think Zechariah doesn't know that that's Isaiah and this is the prophet of the Messiah? He's at church, you know he's paying attention. You know what I mean when I say he's at church. Like you, you got your best on. Mentally. Well, isn't that interesting? This is before he's born. And he's been raised by a parent to acknowledge that. And now it's being fulfilled in his life. Born six months before Jesus. Right? Best we understand. Well, and uh, turning the heart, I think that turning the hearts back is uh, uh, Malachi. It, oh, in the in, in chapter four, verse six, in turning the hearts back to the people, turning the hearts back to the people, is that Malachi 4 6? Yeah, and see, that comes out of Malachi 4 6. So the key verses for John is Malachi 3, I mean, chapters, Malachi 3. Malachi 4 and Isaiah 40. Agreed? And this is what he's going to fulfill in his ministry. And that's the purpose of, that's the purpose of his birth. It, can I tell you, how are we identified? In, is this a big deal? I mean, there's, there's never been a birth like this, right? In all the history of mankind, there's never been one like this. Because he's going to be the guy, the prophet, who's going to announce the coming of the Messiah. That's, that's what... We started in Genesis looking forward to it, and now we're, we're there. We've gone through the whole Old Testament to get here. That's pretty good stuff. So, John comes along. It's given to his parents, and his parents do a pretty good job with this. And... Um, now John is fulfilling that mission, that ministry. He's fulfilling it. Oh, Jesus calls him the greatest ever born among mankind because of his role that he faithfully did. And yet, he says 
to you and I, in comparison, we're the least and the least is greater because of our because we are in Christ, not talking about his coming. Absolutely. Yes. Out, out, out from. Right. Out from his mother's womb. Yep. Yeah, it is. Um, that's a whole nother subject. Okay. But it is a subject. Yep. Thanks. They describe, and this is a, the, what say one, two, three, four. I'm at five. They describe, talking about the harmony of the Gospels in regard to this baptism, they describe the uniqueness of John the Baptist's identification of the person of the Messiah by the Holy Spirit descending like a dove and resting on him or remaining on him. And, and, and some of them are going to say that John, John would see a dove In like a form. I mean, you go like, it won't be a, 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 you won't miss it. Well, maybe it was a mirage. Maybe it was, um, maybe it was gas or maybe it was something else out there. I don't know, right? Look, and so it's going to come, it's going to come. You're going to recognize it. It will be in a form of a dove. It will be in the form of a dove, one says. And will it will flutter down and it will rest on him. And that that is the picture of the Holy Spirit coming upon him in this baptismal service. For what reason? To identify him as the Messiah, the the Savior, right? So that's the deal. Uh, no, they all saw the dove. They all saw the dove. That's what I just, did I not just say that? Yeah. Now watch this. All but John, all but John also record a voice out of heaven. John doesn't record the voice out of heaven. But Matthew, Mark, and Luke, the synoptic gospel, always, all of them gave you the voice. Okay. This is my beloved son, Matthew's account, Mark. This is my beloved son, whom I'm well pleased. Uh, number four or number six, that the sixth thing they all seem to have in common that is of importance to what I call the main thrust of what is there. They all mention that Jesus Christ would baptize with the Holy Spirit. All four of them talk about that. Only Matthew and Luke mention both Jesus's baptism of the spirit and the baptism of fire. Only Matthew and Luke mention both baptisms, the baptism of the Holy Spirit and the baptism of fire. And that's unique that those, those two did. This six-point outline I've just given you is important to our study to identify the four baptisms associated with Jesus Christ. Without that, you can see you don't have them you don't have the four. You got to put the harmony of gospel together to see all four. Do you understand that? And that's where that's the reason I did this to show you because I'm going to study the four baptisms associated with Jesus. You can't get there. You cannot get there without this, the, the harmony of the gospels. Okay, here's the second thing. The other thing that we should look at and listen, why am I, listen, for those who are visiting with us on the internet, this is who we are. We're doctrinal studies. This is who we are. This is how we study. You go like, that's a whole lot of stuff going on there. I just, I just tuned in to figure out how I could get from, you know, this is Wednesday. I was just hoping that I could get some information to get to Thursday with some sanity in my life. Well, Maybe before we get over, you'll get that. But this is how we teach. If you're, if you want to learn the Bible, if you want to become a student of the Bible, that's what we're after. That's our, 
That's our fourth day. So I just encourage you, hang on. I may get around. Depends on the Holy Spirit. May get around to your need. Just hang in there. Here's the second thing. Each of the four Gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, gives something uniquely important that the other one doesn't mention. So I want to, I want to highlight this for you. And maybe I will tease you. Maybe I will tease you to see, to look in your study Bible later today, not now, <laughs> later, to see if they have a harmony of the Gospels. You could very well have a harmony of the Gospel and do this research on your own. And if you don't have a harmony of gospel, it might be well worth an investment to see if you can find one off of Amazon or someplace. That's where I'd go to see if you have one. You can get one because it's a, a wonderful tool, but some study Bibles have it in your Bible. Uh, you can look later. M Matthew, for example, Matthew 13, uh, uh, third chapter 13 through 17, which we are studying, records a personal conversation with John, with John the Baptist and Jesus regarding baptism, water baptism. Nobody else talks that way. Mark, he pretty much stays with Matthew, except in verse 2, Mark does something. Mark included the Messianic prophecy of Malachi 3.1 and then gets heavier into it, uh, um, well, I don't want to talk about that, but anyhow, he when in Matthew's account, in, in the baptismal account, he only gives you Isaiah. You remember Isaiah for you. Uh, but Mark, he 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 punches that that one. In uh, Luke's account of the John's baptism with Jesus, in uh, this is really important for historians. All the guys in here that are history buffs, this is really important. Because in Luke, the third chapter, verse 1 and 2, and then verse 23, Luke, which is typical of Luke, he gives historical dating clues of John the, John the Baptist uh, baptizing Jesus. He goes into, I mean, when you get through with, John, uh, with uh, Luke's account, you know exactly when this occurred. Uh, verse 23 will tell you that John is 31, because it says Jesus is about 30. Now, about 30 means it could be 29 or 31. Is that what about mean? I don't know. Anyhow, it's about 30. <laughs> I don't know. Somewhere around 30. Man, I don't know how this horseshoes we're playing here. I don't know how close we are. I don't know if we got a leaner or what we got here. Uh, so, but that's one, and there's an, in Luke, the third chapter, verses 10 through 14, uh, Luke, Luke does something else. Luke records that John the Baptist's ministry, uh, his message, his message was qualifying VIP passes for the coming of the Christ. And he, and he goes into great, this, he goes into how he qualified people. That's, that's kind of, that's kind of interesting. Of course, we studied last time, we studied John 1, um, in that 29 through 34, John records, John records, John, that's the the writer of the gospel, John records uh, John the Baptist's testimony that he did not know who the Messiah was until he actually baptized him. You remember the words, he did, not, John says it over, I did not recognize who it was before I actually baptized him. Remember that? Oh, gosh. Okay. And, and then he records, then he knew that Jesus was the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. He mentions that in verse 29 and 36. In John 1, John says, and I don't think this on your paper. Could be that if you wrote it. But John 1, 33 John records that the Lord told him, God, he upon whom you see the spirit descend and remain upon him, this is the one who will baptize with the Holy Spirit. John said, I saw it, and therefore we know what he's going to do. So, now, I want us to go back and take a look at Matthew, if you would, with me. 
I broke Matthew down into a little more detail because I, met, or I, w I became really intrigued with this conversation. And so I broke it down to take a heavy look at it in verses 13 through 17. And so I broke it into four aspects. The purpose, the prevent, the permit, and the plan of God is what I saw. And so in verse 13, Jesus initiates. Now, John's been doing this a pretty good while. Um, how long, we don't know, but he's been doing a pretty good while. And now God tells, apparently, God tells Christ it's time for baptism. Agreed? I mean, we're going to learn this later when he says, he uses the word timing. But in verse 13, I, as I read it earlier to you in verse 13, Jesus arrived from Galilee at the Jordan coming to John to, for this purpose, to be baptized by him. That's why he came. He's held off. He's held off. He's held off. He's held off. It's time to go. Boom. I'm there. Right? That's that. So that's important. What is the purpose? I mean, John is preparing people looking for the Messiah. He's baptizing, looking, right? Every time he baptizes somebody, he's looking. Then Jesus shows up and he's caught up with all these people coming to him. And he's qualifying them for VIP passes to be part of the crowd that will welcome the Messiah when he comes. And Jesus shows up and he's so not like everybody who's been coming. And so he has this conversation with him. And so Jesus has to explain to him. And he will why he needs to do this. Because he goes, listen, look at the word prevent in verse 14. In verse 14, it says, but John tried to prevent him. And what I like about this, Jesus understands what John doesn't is not getting. He doesn't say to him, get behind me, Satan, like he did with Peter, who tried to prevent him, right? He doesn't do that because he understands there's a difference here. And so he... At this point, anyhow, but we have this word prevent. It's kind of an interesting word. I'm going to spell it for, I'm going to spell it for you. It's D-I-A, which is a preposition attached to a word, D-I-A, D-I-A. And then it's the word K-O-L-U-O, -O, Kaluo. It's D-I-A, Kaluo. And when you add that preposition to front of this word, which means to forbid, the K-O-L-U-O -O means to forbid something. That's why it's what prevent. It means to forbid. But when you put the D-I-A on it, that preposition on front of it, it refers to thoroughly forbid. I mean, he was balking big time. That's kind of interesting. And it's also interesting that it's an imperfect active indicative in the Greek language. I mean, he didn't just say one time. I mean, he got, um, oh, I don't know the word, but I mean, he just, there was no way he was going to do that. Right? It's just, and he kept on saying, look, I'm not going to do that. This is, look, you misunderstand my ministry, Jesus. I mean, listen, in John's mind, I mean, he got to a point. Here's, here's this point he got to. It's a, Either or neither. He got to a place of either, neither. Either we both need this or neither of us need this. Either, neither. He's going to say, listen to what he said in verse 14. I have need to be baptized by you, and do you come to me? And he's balking. It's an either-neither concept in his mind. 
Because he's going to tell Jesus, well, then, you, if that's true, then you need to baptize me. And Jesus says, no. See, he's at an either or neither place. You understand that? Either we both go or neither of us. Okay. This brings Jesus' discussion with him. This is our dialogue going now. Jesus answered and said to him, permit it at this time. For in this way, permit it at this time. See, it's all about timing. Perfect timing in the plan of God. Listen, we all need to live in that idea. This is how our life operates. Every day of our life operates this way. Permit it at this time. For in this way, it is fitting for us. Watch out for us. To fulfill all righteousness. In other words, to bring the plan of God out into human history. This, we had, this is our, our destiny opening of ministries. This is what it's about, John. Permit it. And so the word permit. Uh, and, and by the way, this, uh, this word in the Greek language is an aorist active imperative. Second person plural. And he said, we, we are both. You permit that. Listen, you've got to do it. And that's why I'm here. You've got to do this. And I need the baptism. You, this, you need this in your ministry. Because that's why you are in ministry. And he puts it. That's a strong. That's a strong command. An aorist imperative is about the strongest command you can get. Bob used to call it the hut two. <laughs> The hut to command. That's a, it's about as strong as it get. It is fitting. It is, it is the right thing to do at the right time. And if there's a great message for our life, that's the deal. And you know, you have to be on your toes when that hits. Because, listen, when you in your soul goes like, whoa. I'm in that moment and, and some, and we all have those moments. Do we not some more than others? Cause you're aware of it. When that happens, I'm going to tell you what you got to pay attention to. Everything, every moment in that experience is vitally important. You've got to be really on your toes. What's going on in that moment. I mean, let, let me, I was at a funeral. The reason I wasn't here last night, we was up in, Al and I, and a group of us were up in uh, Rome, Georgia. And Al and I had the service. Jack wanted to have a part of it. I introduced, I did the, I did the front part of it. Then we had the song and and Jack. Jack wanted to speak on behalf of his wife and, and we didn't Al and I both thought there was nobody better and a minister. I mean, he's not gosh, he's been in the ministry a pretty good while, ain't he, Al? I don't know how many years, but he, most of you know Jack is a pretty good while. So normally as a pastor you don't let anybody that is in the moment of trauma in the pulpit, so to speak. You don't let them, because you don't know where they're going to go. I mean, it's a, but we both agreed that Jack would be all right with it, and nobody more qualified to talk about his own wife because of Proverbs 31, let the husband at the gate praise his wife, right? And and it, it was good, and it was, but at about half, I mean, it was, he did a pretty lengthy deal on it, and it, about an hour, and somewhere in there, you knew that this was a therapeutic moment for Jack. Jack needed to have that. I mean, it just, right out. I mean, there's no doubt, no doubt in my mind. And then when he gets through, we have another song, and then Al's got a shot, and then I'm supposed to bring the message. Right? 
Long time. And so, but I want to tell you where the moment comes. It comes when you realize how this whole moment is now going to be changed and you got to adjust. Where I was going to be as a, as a main speaker at it, I've now become a facilitator. And it was as clear as a bell in my soul when I realized a little, and it wasn't long into that thing, I knew that this was therapy for him. This was something, and, and I looked out there, and I could see the people knew it too. I could see it in them. And at that point, I had to make my adjustments. There's no way I'm going to speak. I mean, and, and he wants, he's, he's assigned Al with the gospel. Al did a great job on it. But you could tell, I mean, now Al and I are sitting there, and the funeral director is really getting nervous. He's pacing back and forth out there. But look, and it's all good. Listen, permit, because this is the timing, and it is fitting for us. And you just start, you start now making adjustments for what God wants done with this, not what you pre-thought, right? And I'm not the only guy that does that. We all do this. Um, but when you do, you got it. When, when that clicked inside my soul, I knew that I had now become a facilitator. And now it was a matter of me figuring out how I could do that because I had the lead position, how could I do that and manage that? Uh, knowing that we have a lot of people, we had them standing. I mean, and I'm, I, I'm not. I'm just saying that th we all have these moments, and when you when that clicks, you've got to readjust. And now everything going on, you've got to be on top of your game. You've got to be on top of your game. I mean, because this is a big God thing now. Do you not? Do you not realize that? I mean, they both of them were big God things, you know, going to a funeral and do that. But now it becomes really in your own personal life. It becomes bigger than life in itself. I mean, how do how do you now switch? Hat, how do you change hats and be in, be able to manage this? And I, I just and it and and I just came out of studying this. Okay, I just came out of studying this very thing, and God puts me in it, and I go like, cha-ching. I mean, who does that but God? Man, I'm not smart enough to figure all that stuff out. But I just studied it. I just studied this very thing with John and Jesus, preparing for when I got back to bring this message. And I just thought, and I know we all have these, but. And so under perfect timing, he explains that to John. So John says, okay, perfect timing of God. So John baptizes him, cha-ching. I mean, John, John still thought he was baptizing somebody he shouldn't be baptizing. He, you know, I need to be baptized too then. It's either or neither. Jesus said, well, permit it now, and you'll know. And as soon as he dipped him in, right, once he submerged him or brought him up, da-da-da-da-da-da-da-da, da-da-da-da-da-da, right? Then everything returns to a kind of a normal routine with God in your life. That's just interesting. You do, you do know this, don't you? And, and then look at verse 16, 17. I love what happens in verse 16 and 17. And, it, and, it, and immediately, <laughs> did you love that? Immediately, from the, immediately up from the water, and behold, the heavens were opened. Do you know how big the deal that is? I don't know. You know, they opened the dam and water and they shut it off and they opened it up. Open the heavens. We got three and open them up so that a dove goes through three heavens. I don't know. It was a big moment. Can I tell you that's a big moment? You know, I th and I thought about this too. You know, when a person dies, that heaven, th those three heavens open up and they fly back. Well, it's just interesting. Just opening heavens has just kind of got me intrigued at a funeral. 
um, the heavens. That's three. Paul said, I was caught, caught up third heaven. The heavens were open. I saw the spirit of God descending like a dove and coming upon him. And then I behold what, what, um, that is another time I'll get you two of beholds. And behold a voice out of the heavens. Let's see there. Oh, I got to look at verse 16. I got to behold. Look at verse 17. I got to behold. See, those beholds are like. This is not one thing. This is two things that are occurring. And one of them would have been enough to stagger your world. But two of them, this is lights out. Agreed? What was the first behold? The dove. The heavens opened. You peek in there. People waving back. I don't know. All I see is a dove, but it's coming out of the three heavens. That's a behold. And the second behold, I mean, these are life-changing beholds. And behold, a voice out of the heavens saying, this is my beloved son whom I'm well pleased. And I guess then the heavens closed up, right? Waiting on another event. Second coming, right? I guess. I just find all this interesting. I just find it all interesting. Well, number four. Oh my goodness, I gotta quit. Did you notice that three did you notice the three the three conversations? There were three conversations. John to Jesus, Jesus to John, and then God, right? Where's the voice? Voice out of heaven. Yeah. Voice out of heaven. And then when you look, look at the whole thing, you got all three members of Godhead involved in this, right? And we know that anytime you got all three members of Godhead involved in any event, it's a biggie. Um, let me close. You can do the final point, point five. I, I really didn't think I'd get to it any, <laughs> anyhow, but it was part of my thoughts I wrote down. This baptism was not about literal water any more than a foot washing. It involved it, but it's not what it was about any more than foot washing was. It was rather a spiritual lesson about John the Baptist identifying the person of the Messiah. Agreed? That was a major, that was a major point. All right. Well, thank you so much. Let's have a word of prayer. What a great class you are. <laughs> I tell you, it is, you are so much fun to teach. You are so much fun. Oh, quit now. Just give me money. <laughs> Father, we, we are so thankful tonight for this lesson to be able to realize and talk about some tools that would be important in our life, maybe in our studies, especially in this church. We are, we are people who like all the tools that we can get to make our, um, our ministries more accurate and on the whatever. And so we thank you for that. We, we thank you for this wonderful ministry out of the word of God to our souls and some of the things that we could see that would be actually practical to us. For example, the least in the kingdom of heaven. The, the least, those who are in Christ are superior to anything else in this world. I mean, we're, we're in a higher status than angels, the creation order. I mean, it's a pretty amazing thing when we just stop to think what privileged we are to be in Christ. We're in the world, but we're in Christ. And therefore, we need to be about him and not about the world. In the world, but not of the world. In Christ and of Christ. Oh, Father, may that be the message of our life. May that be the message that touches other people to want to have a relationship with Christ as well. In Jesus' name, amen.